Right, hello and good afternoon everybody. Welcome back to another one of my Friday afternoon webinars. Um, I'll give a few moments for uh, those people who are still trying to sign in uh, to join me. I can see the attendee numbers uh, uh, clocking up as everybody um, manages to, to successfully join me this afternoon. If there was anybody who was trying to um, join me at 10 o'clock this morning, I do apologize. Um, this is what happens when you use American software. Uh, it automatically defaults to uh, American Eastern time. Um, and of course, um, you know, it, nobody was around at 10 o'clock in British time uh, to be able to go through the webinar. So apologies to anybody who did uh, try and uh, log on this morning. But for those of you who did and have joined me this afternoon, thank you very much uh, for, for taking the time uh, to continue to listen to me. So today's webinar um, is so important. Um, we only heard last night um, with uh, Boris Johnson having his first sort of um, um, briefing after being away for quite some time, recovering, first of all, contracting the coronavirus and then sort of going through a recovery period of it. Um, and, you know, the key message that was coming out of yesterday's um, briefing was we are now going to start looking at when we are going to come out of furlough, lockdown and quarantine. So today's webinar is, is quite um, quite apt, I think, um, because I'm going to be looking at ways um, um, back to work after furlough. Um, I have three big steps where I'm going to prepare your business strategy. Um, and hopefully, if we've got time at the end of it, we will be able to have a, a live Q&A session. Just a very quick reminder on the dashboard that you have in front of you. Um, you can uh, have a chat. Um, or you can ask questions um, down the right hand side. Um, I will try and answer the questions as I go along, um, but I think I'll be more keen to try and get through my webinar. And as I've done previously, we will collate all those questions, give you some comprehensive answers and send it out to you at the end of it. So for those of you who have joined me, I'm Angela Clay. Um, I'm an HR and employment law solicitor. Today is Wednesday, the 1st of May. Can we believe it? May already. Um, and um, as I say, what I'm going to be looking at is back to work after furlough. I'm MD of HR for UK. Um, HR for UK is a leading HR and employment, payroll and pensions and health and safety service provider. We've got over 30 years of experience and we've got some lovely five star reviews on our website. And I would really encourage you to go to our website and um, to have a look at those if you, uh, you know, want to read how good we are. Um, so again, um, I, I'm Angela Clay, as I've already said, I am an HR and employment law solicitor, and I am the managing director of HR for UK. And I'm responsible for HR for UK's role in leading businesses out of furlough, out of the crisis that we're in, and providing clear, uh, clear, practical advice um, to make sure that UK businesses come out of this on the right side of the law. Got to get practicing on that section. Not quite good at that yet. Um, so again, my vision is for your business to come out of this crisis successfully by offering you clear, professional, practical advice and support. So preparing your business strategy. So on today's webinar, you're going to be having, uh, I'm going to go through, uh, you know, three big chunky areas of um, how you can successfully plan what to do when furlough ends, how to safely plan redundancies, short time working and layoff, and how to manage staff overhead costs so that you can bounce back to success fast. So again, as I've already said, use the chat box um, and the questions to ask any questions. And as I'm going through my webinar today, I will try and answer those. Um, please do ask questions. Your questions are important to us um, so that we can provide you with the answers and the support and guidance that you need going forward. So please do, on, uh, do provide those questions because um, I look forward to seeing them. Just a bit of housekeeping again. This um, webinar is being recorded. There are slides that will be made available to you. So to, to make the most of it, um, we will be sending you copies of the video recording. Um, we will be sending you presentation slides 
and a list of all the Q&As. Um, we have actually also um, popped a little handout um, into the um, uh, dashboard. So again, you know, please do have a look at that handout. It will be sent to you um, once the webinar has been completed. Um, and again, it's just it's just there to help you, um, you know, through the webinar, remind you of little things that you want to um, that you need to do sort of an action plan afterwards. Um, there will also be a little link to my previous webinars. So again, if you want to have a look at those, remind yourself of what I've talked about before. Please do go there. So today's webinar, we are going to be looking at your business strategy for when furlough ends. So I'm going to help you um, create a successful plan for when furlough ends. I'm going to talk to you about creating strategies to avoid the risks of um, falling foul of the law, making sure that you remain compliant when it comes to planning short time working, layoff, redundancies, and other options that you could consider, and also strategies on how you can manage your staff overhead so that you can bounce back fast, because of course cash is king. Um, and you know, we need to make sure that we look after um, the cash flow to be able to um, ensure that you can continue to pay staff wages. So what to do when furlough ends? I think the question actually is, what should you be doing now before furlough ends? Because what you want to do is you want to make sure that you are ahead of your competition by successfully having a plan for when furlough does end. As I've already mentioned, it's still very much up in the air when we are going to be coming out of lockdown, quarantine. Um, is it going to be on a phased um, return to normal? Um, is it going to be done by demographics? We don't know. But what we do know is that there is a clear indication that we are going to be starting to have the um, restrictions lifted, whether it be in the next two weeks, three weeks, we re at this point in time, we don't know, um, but we do know that it is coming and we do need to plan and prepare for that. Many businesses will want to be starting to make that transition seamless. Um, if you all cast your minds back to when um, COVID-19 first became um, a, 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 um, um, an infection that was being transferred between people. Um, we, we, we didn't really understand what we were facing. Um, some of us ran for the hills, some of us um, sat back and waited for things to happen. But what we do know is before we knew where we were, the furlough scheme was introduced, the job, uh, the coronavirus job retention scheme was introduced. And before we even had our time to even think on how that was going to be operating, uh, we were put into lockdown. So we really didn't have the time to seamlessly go into lockdown. So let's make sure that when we come out of it, we can actually um, uh, do it uh, with a plan in mind. Over the last couple of weeks, I've started to advise quite a few businesses on their plans on returning back to work. Um, it's not going to be a simple case of, right, we can go back to work, everybody back in, let's dust off the covers and continue as normal. Um, because normal will be different to what it was when we first uh, um, went on to furlough. So I'm going to look at areas where you can start getting the ball rolling. How you manage your return after furlough will depend on your closure arrangements. So Typically, this would have been either your business stopped trading and everybody was sent home unfurloughed, or you continued to partially trade where some of your staff were furloughed and some of your staff perhaps continued to uh, remain in the workplace, um, abiding by um, the, the guidance of only carrying out essential work and, of course, only carrying out that work in a safe working environment with social distancing, PPE, protection, etc., etc or your business has been fully trading with all your staff working from home. So the business's priorities in returning back to the working environment is to make sure that you do so on a safe way. So your safe return of your staff must be primary uh, concern and at the front of your, of your thought process. So as I mentioned, we, we all went off, um, you know, either, you know, ran off to the hills um, or it was a planned, um, working from home remote working has become the new norm now is this something that you would be wanting your business to be continuing doing as things go back to 
working in business rather than remote working. If remote working is going to be a long term strategy, there are lots of things that you'll need to consider and perhaps do retrospectively, because as I said, when you first went off and everybody was working remotely, it was an emergency situation. It was no time to put in a, a working from home policy. There was no time to put in a working from home procedure. There were no risk assessments. It was literally grab your laptop and off you go. Um, but if, if um, remote working is going to be a long term uh, process that the company is going to continue doing, then I would strongly recommend that you start thinking about getting those policies, procedures and risk assessments in place. Um, because different people have responded to home working in different ways. There are some employees who have absolutely relished in it. Um, they have got, um, uh, you know, that they've got their work life balance um, sorted. They're not commuting those long hours to and from work. Uh, work life balance has really become quite nice. Um, you may have had um, staff members who previously would have missed tucking ch uh, young children into bed at night because they've been working late, whereas being at home has given them the opportunity to do that. But there are also some employees who have really found it really hard and are struggling with home remote working um, because they're not used to being in the same closed environment, uh, work and home is, suddenly has become the same place. Uh, those people who uh, prefer to be in a more social environment um, will probably have struggled a lot more than those who are quite comfortable in their own, um, you know, basically being in their own company. So again, you will need to have a look. And, and again, I've already mentioned this. Um, if you are going to continue with remote working and you didn't have those policies and procedures and risk assessments in place, um, a planning tip. So again, if you want to make a planning tip, because of course this whole webinar is about making that plan, planning tip is do you need to revisit a home working policy um, or carry out a, a risk assessment for those who are going to continue working from home and do remember that a, a home working policy or a remote working policy must form part of an employee's handbook which they must be able to access relatively easy um, so again we, we've talked about those who are going to carry on working from home but what about those that you want to get back into the actual work environment so let's have a look at your office premises so as a business owner, you will need to put measures in place to help combat the spread of the virus. Health and safety is a key thing. Your work, if your workplace is currently, um, I take that all back, health and safety remains your primary, a, a key responsibility that employers and business owners need to make sure that they abide by. It, this hasn't changed. This has always been the case, but there are certain measures that you'll have to do in addition to your, your normal uh, obligations. So chances are your current workplace has been cleaned on a regular basis um, with the increase of transmission um, almost a certainty. You will have to put in additional measures. So it's quite difficult to prevent the spread of respiratory infections, uh, but there are some steps that you can take to try and reduce that risk. Of course, we know that the main way uh, um, COVID-19 and other respiratory um, infections are spread is through cl close proximity. We all know about the two meter rule. Um, and also we know about when someone touches a person or an object, and has got those respiratory droplets um, containing the virus either on that person or on um, uh, objects. Um, and this is spread through coughing and sneezing. And then of course, touching their nose and faces and all these things that, that sort of uh, encourage the spread. Like any other workplace hazard, employers must carry out a risk assessment to identify the likelihood of their employees contracting COVID-19. So measures that uh, you can put in place will need to be uh, considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and I would strongly recommend that you carry out a risk assessment. Uh, a risk assessment will identify the risks, the actions you need to take, um, and the timeline within which you need to do that. So 
just having a look at some of those risks, um, we, we, we've again have been guided by government guidance is to ensure that you have good hygiene practices in place. Reducing face-to-face -face contact where possible um, and where precautions can uh, be put in place to prevent um, or to reduce the risk of infections within your business. So you'll need to consider whether you have a COVID-19 risk assessment H and health and safety policy. Um, if you haven't got one, I would strongly recommend that you do that. So again, a planning tip, review any health and safety policies that you may have to ensure that they include the element of COVID-19. Again, any health and safety policy should form part of your employment handbook. Um, so again, as I said, that planning tip, review your uh, health and safety policies and procedures. So there are other um, steps that you can take to achieve a more hygienic uh, workplace, for example, hand washing. Um, we all know that hands need to be washed uh, frequently and thoroughly uh, for at least 20 seconds with hot water and soap. Some of us do it with the happy birthday song. Some of us do it with the baked potato song. Some of us just wash our hands. Um, but again, you know, it, it's making sure that um, uh, staff are encouraged to wash their hands frequently uh, and thoroughly for at least 20 seconds. If you have uh, reusable or fabric uh, towels in uh, your bathrooms or your washrooms, um, you should consider maybe replacing these with paper towels so that they can have a single use and they can be disposed of immediately after they have been used. Sanitising gel, uh, again, having sanitising gel um, throughout uh, your workplace. Um, these can be little bottles um, or you can have a complete sanitising um, workstation. Um, as long as you make sure that there is the facility um, where hand sanitising gel can be used. Um, have them in common places, so for example, bathrooms, uh, kitchens, high traffic areas, you might want to have it in reception areas um, or, or meeting rooms or places where people will tend to you, congregate. Of course, you will still need to ensure that you abide by the uh, um, social distancing if you, if you do put well, we would encourage you to put bottles of hand sanitizer in those places, but you wouldn't necessarily meet. Tissues is another um, way that you can um, support um, um, your business. Plenty of supply of easy to access tissues. You don't want somebody who's going to have to faff around with a tissue box to try and get a tissue out. Make sure it is an easy access tissue. Um, tissue box so that if, if someone is sneezing or coughing they can do so into a tissue and then really get dispose of that really quickly and easy and, and of course immediately. Another step that you can take um, is, uh, try, uh, is to discourage staff from sharing equipment such as keyboards, telephones, mice, anything else that they may share. If you do have, if staff do have to share equipment, make sure that there is antibacterial wipes um, for them to use at the start and at the end of their shift or at the start or the end of them using the shared equipment. Um, so again, a planning tip there. Do you have any of these in place? Have you got sanitizing gel? Have you got tissues? Have you got disposable um, um, uh, towels for the bathroom? Um, if not, I suggest planning tip, Put it in there, place your order now, because like you, there will be hundreds of other businesses trying to make the same, um, place the same orders. So be prepared and place those orders sooner rather than later. Other ways that you can sort of um, encourage um, or, or discourage the, um, the spread of the virus, shaking hands has now become something that we don't do anymore. So again, ask staff, Customers and clients, um, make them aware that you will not be shaking hands. Um, it may be necessary to install notices either in the workplace, um, in public areas, perhaps in reception areas, meeting rooms. Um, just a, a little notice sort of explaining that um, why staff won't be shaking hands. Again, a planning tip, if you need to have a notice put up, you might want to seek some professional advice and guidance on what that notice needs to actually look like and what it needs to contain. Um, again, I've talked about touching faces, 
it's one of those things that we do naturally but again you may want to sort of put up signage um, around the workplace um, reminding staff uh, not to touch faces um, their nose and their, their mouths particularly if their hands are dirty Social distancing is a very, very important aspect of um, trying to contain the spread of the virus. We all know what it's like when we want to go and do our, our shopping. Um, you know, we're either in a, a one-way system in our local supermarket or we only allowed one or two um, uh, members of the public into a, a closed space. Uh, and we are becoming very, very familiar with that uh, um, to keeping two meters apart. So again, there are things that you can do. You can have floor mats um, created, developed uh, and placed down so people know where they need to stand. Uh, you might want to consider having um, you know, uh, markers put out um, on the floor, uh, again, to sort of uh, demonstrate uh, what that social distancing looks like. Um, but employers can um, do a lot of other things to ensure that they, they have that social distancing. You might want to consider reducing the number of members of staff um, who are on the premises at any one given time. Um, you might want to reduce the number of uh, people who can go into confined places at one uh, given time. So, for example, you might only allow one person in at, um, your bathrooms or kitchen at one time. Um, again, just making sure that uh, you keep that social distancing. You might want to rearrange your shift patterns uh, to ensure that um, you, you don't have too many individuals in the workplace at one time if you can for example have a morning shift or an afternoon shift or if you've got two people doing the same type of work perhaps alternate where one individual works from home one week and another individual works in the office and rotate it so again it's it's all about keeping that social distancing in place and it's about having those processes in, in and procedures thought about as you can implement that already talked about putting signs up um, about social distancing floor markings to make the, uh, the visual two meter distancing uh, especially in areas um, where there is likely to be a queue um, arrange um, rearrange workstations so again you may have um, you know block bench type workstations you may need to spread that out a little bit you may need to put people in different workstations to ensure that you can comply with that um, social distancing. And again, little things like staggering start times, finish times, um, rest breaks, lunch breaks, all of those, start thinking about those because you'd need to have a clear process and procedure in place on how you are going to be operating once um, staff come back into to, to the workplace. So again, another planning tip, if you require signs, order now because again there are going to be hundreds of other businesses doing the same thing and um, we've got some referral partners and um, who we can refer you to and um, who can help you design your specific workplace um, 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 signage we've got some excellent partners that we can sign you up with and um, there is no there is no um, there's no benefit to me if they are trusted business partners that we work with um, and um, their details will be available um, in the uh, slides that we're going to send to you. And again, um, you know, we'll be more than happy to point you in the right direction if you're not quite sure where you need to go. Um, so again, in some businesses, it's, it's simply not possible um, to practice social distancing. Um, and the government has issued specific guidance um, for specific sectors where that may well be um, a, a problem. So if you are in an organ in a in a sector where social distancing is a problem, do visit the government's website. I'll, again, I will make sure that these are on the slides and the information that gets sent out to you. Um, but uh, the guidance um, can be found at www.gov.uk forward stroke guidance social distancing in the workplace during coronavirus COVID-19 sector guidance. Don't worry about that. I will send you the link so you can get straight to the right um, uh, website. Um, it is an employer's responsibility and it is an employer's duty to mitigate and reduce the risk of transmitting COVID-19. So don't think, oh, I can get away with it because actually you will need to take responsibility. 
And the HSC guidance has also um, provided um, you know, details on employees' uh, duties and responsibilities in terms of health and safety during uh, lockdown, including taking steps to protect uh, their start from COVID-19. Um, the HSE um, website is updated regularly uh, and I would certainly strongly advise as part of your plan um, is that you make a note um, in, in perhaps your default diary just to check the HSC um, government, uh, sorry, the HSC and the government website uh, to see if there are any changes or anything else that you need to do. Um, Again, something else you should have a, a, a thought on um, is um, your cleaning arrangements that you have for your workplace. Um, whether your business has been opened or closed, um, you might need to consider whether you need to carry out a deep clean or whether you need to increase the frequency um, in which your workplace um, is being cleaned. Um, so again, top tip uh, for planning, review your current cleaning arrangements um, and adjust as appropriate. Um, if you need to increase the frequency, get in contact with your uh, cleaning company or the, the, who carries out that task. Of course, if you need to have a specialist deep clean, um, you should uh, book it in sooner rather than later. It's part of the cleaning process. Um, rubbish, you know, how do you dispose of rubbish? Um, dispose, rubbish disposal should be carried out in the normal case. Unless there is an individual who is showing symptoms um, or is suspected of having COVID-19. In this instance, you, you should take their rubbish and you should put it in a bin liner. You should tie it securely and you should put that bin liner in a second bin liner and again tie that securely. You should mark it and you should, quite bizarrely, store it in a safe place. Um, if the individual comes back as tested negative, you can dispose of it in the normal way. If, however, the individual has come back and they have tested positive, the local health protection team will be in contact with you to tell you how to dispose of um, that particular waste. Another thing that um, um, business owners should bear in mind, Legionella is another high risk um, um, uh, respiratory um, infection a disease that can be transmitted. Um, and Legionella is, is really, it comes from water systems that haven't been used regularly. And again, it will depend on what circumstances your building is in, whether it went into a um, immediate close down, whether you had the ability to uh, lock down. It's also whether there's been somebody in the building or not, as the case may be. But again, for small systems, um, you can uh, carry out some easy steps, but we would strongly advise that you perhaps consider taking out, um, having a, a, risk, a water risk assessment carried out uh, before you get staff to return in. Small systems, as I say, uh, these can be flushed out uh, by running water for about two to five minutes. Um, it should be long enough to ensure that um, fresh water is drawn into the symptom, uh, into the system. Um, switch off heating devices, um, you know, take professional advice in terms of what you should do in terms of um, perhaps flushing out your systems. So again, a top tip, top, top planning tip, put my teeth in, um, is do you need to carry out a water uh, risk assessment? Do you need to take professional advice, which we would strongly advise that you do if your system is large or complex? Um, and do you need to carry out any additional steps uh, to ensure that your water is safe uh, for when your staff return? Um, I've talked about rotating staff, I've talked about restrooms, and I've talked about kitchens, social distancing, um, protective um, um, equipment if you need to, if you need it, PPE. Again, a planning tip if you're going to have to order any uh, PPE, I suggest you do it sooner rather than later because there may be long delays as PPE is given priority to NHS. And this is all before you've even got any staff in. This is before anybody's even walked into the building. So hopefully you've got some top tips um, uh, to help you with planning. Uh, Lucy O'Neill, I see you have um, uh, provided a question. I'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, I do want to try and get through all the questions, you know, through the webinar. Uh, I'm quite conscious that I've only touched on the first step. Um, we've got two more to go. Um, so do hold on to that thought um, and uh, we will get to questions and answers as soon as we can. 
So let's have a look at the next uh, the step that you can take, um, and that is to avoid risks and no compliance um, when bringing staff back. So that is how to safely plan short time working layoff and redundancies and a couple of other options that you may have available to you. So before you even start looking at staffing levels, you need to have a look at your business. What does your business look like post COVID-19, post furlough or in the lead up to coming back out of quarantine? Do you still have a viable business? What does your revenue stream look like? Because all of that is going to dictate to quite a large extent on what your workforce is going to look like. Business will never go back to the way that they were because COVID-19 has changed the way we do things. Um, you will need to consider whether your business is agile enough to survive post furlough beyond COVID-19 impact. Um, you would need to revisit your operations and structure now to make sure that it is going to survive post COVID-19, post the return um, from furlough. Um, because it's not just your business, it's your supply chain. So before you even start looking at the return of your stock, you need to actually have a look at what does your business look like now and what are you going to need to do to ensure its survival. So planning, uh, a, a planning top tip um, is before you consider short term working layoff or redundancies, have a look at your pipeline. What are you going to require from your workforce? If you've already um, had a look at your pipeline, you may be picking up where you left off. Um, you may be starting from scratch. Um, you might be completely overwhelmed with the um, influx of orders uh, that have um, you know, perhaps come in while you have been away. Um, so the big question that you should be asking before you take any drastic steps is it a temporary situation or is it going to be permanent? Because this will make a big difference in the decisions that you make going forward. If it is a temporary redundancy situation, so in other words, you know that the work will be coming, it's just not quite there yet. There are steps that you can take. So if it is temporary, how temporary is temporary going to be? Is it going to be a couple of weeks? Is it going to be months? Is it going to be six months? Is it going to be years? Um, of course, if you start looking at years, that's probably a little bit more permanent than if it's going to be three to six months before um, you know it becomes um, more, um, uh, your business is, is bouncing back. So again, you need to know what you are going to do for your business to make sure that it can bounce back. So if you need to make temporary changes, um, you will perhaps want to consider your options. Just a reminder that employees who have been furloughed um, still have the same employment rights as they did uh, previously. Nothing there changes. They still have statutory rights to sick pay, maternity rights and other parental rights. They have the right against an unfair dismissal and they have a right to statutory pay. Even though the government scheme um, ends on the 30th of June, your business might not be ready to come back on the 30th of June and you might need to look beyond that. Um, so again, what are your options? Again, give some thought onto that and how you are going to address it. So next few minutes, I'm going to talk about what those options are. So give you a little bit of insight. So short time working is one option. Now, short time working is where an employer cannot provide an employee for, uh, work. This is a temporary arrangement. Um, so you can implement short-term working only if your contract of employment allows this. If you don't have the contractual right to put your staff on short-term working, you cannot do it. Because if you had to force through short-term working, you could potentially face a, a claim of breach of contract in an employment tribunal. And also you could uh, face a claim for unpaid wages. Again, it'll be through an employment tribunal. So you need to check to see whether you have the contractual right to put staff on short time uh, working. Short time working, as I said, is a temporary measure. Um, it is another way to try and save jobs, uh, to ensure that there is perhaps the, the it reduces the need to um, make redundancies. 
Now, short time working is where an employee works shorter hours than what they are normally contracted to, and they get paid for the hours that they work. Um, so again, short time working um, is a reduction in pay. So again, it, it has a significant impact on an employee if you are going to be putting them on short time working. If you don't have short time working on a contract, as I've already said, you can't force it through. However, if you signed one of our furlough agreements, one of the clauses that we had is that we provided a short time working option in the agreement, um, which means that you will be able to proceed with uh, short time working without having to go back to the employee because they have already agreed a variation to their contractual terms. If, however, you don't have the contractual rights, you didn't use one of our agreements and you don't have that variation of contract to allow you to impose short time working, not all is lost because you still have some options. Um, you can speak to your employees and get their express written agreement that they will temporarily immediately volunteer to go on to um, short time working. This is the quick fix. This is the easiest way to get go about it if you wanted to get it immediately. The other way is to um, go through a consultation to vary their terms of employment, uh, to include short time working. If you are going to be going down this latter route, you must follow due process um, because you can't unilaterally make that change. Can't force it through. You have to get the employee's agreement because if you don't, this may give rise to a constructive unfair dismissal claim. So it's really, really important to make sure that you get that right. Whichever option you choose, whether you get the um, um, agreement uh, to volunteer to go into short time working or whether you actually go through the variation, um, you must get their express agreement because, as, as I've already said, the corresponding result is that it results in uh, less pay. So another option you can go uh, through, uh, like with short time working, um, you can you can put them on layoff. Layoff is a, again a situation where you have no work um, for uh, the employees to carry out. It's slightly different to short time working. Short time working is where you do have work, but not enough to keep them occupied for their full contractual hours. Um, whereas layoff is there is no work, but you still want to keep them employed. Um, again, it is a temporary measure, so it might be that you are waiting for, um, you know, supply chains to come in, you know, um, um, work to come in through the pipeline. So layoff may be an option, but again, you can only um, implement layoff if you have the contractual right to do so. Um, and again, um, you know, there, there are different rules that apply under layoff. Um, so um, unlike short time working, um, they are paid for the, for the hours that they work. With layoff, subject to eligibility, they will get a statutory guaranteed pay of the paltry sum of £30 for the first five working days um, in a 13 rolling week period, which is a maximum of £150, which is quite um, a drop in comparison to um, what uh, an employee would normally earn. Um, Again, with layoff, there are certain um, aspects to it that you need to be aware of, um, is that an employee has the right to request to be made redundant um, after four consecutive weeks of layoff or a total of six weeks in a 13 week uh, rolling period they have the right to claim redundancy. There is a specific procedure that needs to be followed um, and you must seek professional HR advice to be able to guide you through that to make sure that you don't fall foul on the, uh, so you don't fall foul um, of, of the law and, and um, find yourself in an employment tribunal. Another option is to extend furlough leave. Uh, the principles will be staying exactly the same as what they are in the coronavirus job retention scheme. The only difference is, is you will not be able to claim the money back from the government. So it will be at your cost. Um, and again, without the government support, if you are going to do this, I would strongly advise that you carry out um, a, a, an estimate on how long you will be able to continue a, a furlough scheme. Um, and 
uh, it might actually be a, a useful way of um, getting employees back into work on a phased return. So you may want to keep them on furlough for another couple of weeks, still paying them the 80% of their wages or a cap as you have been of, of two and a half thousand pounds um, as you have been. Um, but again, you you it will be at your cost. So you do need to be mindful um, on how that is going to impact you. Um, so you will need the employee's agreement to remain on furlough. If you've used one of our, our contracts, unfortunately, you will need to get them to sign a new contract because our contract is quite clear that furlough will end when the, uh, uh, um, the scheme comes to an end. But of course, if you are going to extend it beyond that, you will need to get the agreement of your employee to continue remaining on furlough. And the reason for that is because they will be agreeing to reduced wages. Um, so you will need their consent. Um, just a couple of other points, um, you know, perhaps, um, you, you know, uh, layoff and short term working can be used in conjunction, it can be work, uh, used hand in hand. Um, and, and again, you might be thinking, well, who out of all my employees do I decide to lay off? Is there a certain criteria that I have to apply? Unlike redundancy, selecting uh, workers for short time working and layoff, um, there is no uh, criteria. Um, so the decision is yours. However, you must still make sure that no decision is discriminatory. So again, you can't um, choose to put someone on short time working or layoff because of a protected characteristic. So be, be, be sensible and be uh, mindful uh, when you do go through that selection process, if you do need to select. Sometimes it might be quite straightforward and obvious on, on, on how that decision is. It might be skill set based, it might be need based. Um, but again, you know, just be sensible and mindful um, that you don't fall foul of discrimination uh, uh, regulations in, in making that selection. Some contracts of employment might have express clauses um, about short time working and layoff, and it may have express timelines um, that um, limit the number of uh, weeks uh, of, of short time working and layoff. So again, uh, a top planning tip, uh, review contracts of employment, have a look A, to see if you've got that uh, short time working and layoff clause in, and if you do, to see if there are any limitations um, on how long you can actually keep them on short time working or layoff. Statutory sick, normal statutory sick pay uh, rules will apply during any time of short time working or layoff. Um, so again, top tips, do you need to get expert advice on helping you through the myriad of issues that you may come across in implementing short time working? Don't try and do it on your own. The risk is too great. I would strongly advise that you get um, expert support and guidance to help you through that. So the next big sort of step after that is yeah we've talked about all these temporary measures but there are going to be a lot of organizations who are going to be thinking this isn't temporary my business is going to have to make some permanent changes um and it may well be that your business perhaps can't even continue trading and will have to remain closed um but you might have to also consider having a significantly reduced workforce and redundancies may have to um, as a result of that. Um, redundancies, you have to follow due process. It is a legal requirement that the correct process is followed. Redundancy will come as a crushing blow, not only to employees, but as business owners, it will be a very, very difficult decision uh, to actually um, make the decision that redundancies are in fact necessary. Um, but it does take planning. Um, there are strict rules that you have to comply with in terms of redundancies. Um, and again, you know, you need to make sure that you follow that due process. So if you're going to be making more than 20 people re redundant, so it's 20 but less than 100, you must start collective consultation 30 days before giving your first notice of redundancy. So if you're going to be making 20 or more redundancies, you have to start that consultation period and you have to have 30 days before you issue that first notice of redundancy. If you are going to be making more than 100 um, members of staff uh, uh, redundant, that consultation period increases to 45 days before you start, um, um, before you issue that first um, 
notice. Sorry, Lucy, uh, I, I got a little bit distracted there with your question coming in. And again, I'll answer those questions when we come in at the end. And uh, so again, it's been very mindful of the number of uh, employees you are going to be making redundant, whether there are time periods that you need to comply with, because if you get it wrong, um, it could cost you quite dearly. And, you know, when money is already tight, you don't want to fall foul of employment law. Um, so again, uh, redundant staff are still entitled to receive notice um, or, or, or notice uh, pay in lieu of notice. Um, again, payment in lieu of notice, you only have that contractual right. Uh, you can only make it if you have that contractual right in your contract of employment to make a payment in lieu of notice. So again, if that is something that you're going to consider, do go back and check your contracts of employment to see whether you have that contractual right to make that payment in lieu of notice. Of course, a, um, a member of staff that is going to be made redundant is also entitled to holiday and other contractual entitlement, entitlements, as well as statutory redundancy pay if they, um, if they qualify. So again, if they have more than two years service, um, it is slightly different in Northern Ireland. Um, so again, you know, businesses will have to pay that. So it'll be coming out of their, their, their back pocket. I can't stress this enough, um, but you have to follow due process. You must, I, I, as I said, I can't stress it enough. As an employment law solicitor, the number of times where employers have fallen at that last hurdle because they've tried to cut corners, because they're in desperate situations, take the time to plan a proper redundancy process make sure you protect your business safeguard your business and don't expose yourself to those additional uh, potential uh, um, liabilities that you will get uh, you know for, you know for, for getting it wrong it's not worth it um, so do get um, professional advice um, so again those, those are our measures in terms of uh, perhaps um, staff that might be surplus or other measures that you might need to take in place. But let's just spend a, a little bit of time on um, matters to consider with staff that are returning to work. Um, so you may still have some members of staff who still need to continue to shield. Um, it may be that they, they, they are still nervous or concerned about um, returning to work and may feel uh, still a bit vulnerable. Um, if at all possible, allow them to continue working from home. If that is not possible, consider alternatives, um, such as keeping them on uh, furlough for uh, a further period, of course, bearing in mind what I've said earlier about getting their agreement, um, or you might want to consider them taking it as a holiday um, or unpaid leave. So again, have that conversation with the individual uh, concern to try and understand what their concerns are and how you as a business can support them. Of course, giving them the reassurance of all the measures and steps that you are taking um, to make sure that the working environment is a safe working environment for them to come back to. Um, again, COVID-19 isn't just going to disappear um, the moment we uh, lift lockdown. You may still have employees who are symptomatic, um, who show signs of COVID-19 or in fact may become infected. Uh, again, if they are showing signs, they need to self-isolate for seven days. Um, if they are living with someone who is symptomatic or has signs, even if they are not uh, sick themselves, they will need to self-isolate for 14 days that hasn't changed. Um, again, a very stark reality of the circumstances that we are in. Uh, you may have staff who have suffered a bereavement. Um, there is no statutory right to bereavement other than in cases of a child, which was recently introduced um, in April as a result of Jack's law. Um, and again, you should be sympathetic to um, members of staff who have perhaps suffered a, a bereavement and just be um, mindful of what they have perhaps been going through. And perhaps um, you, you may want to consider putting a policy and a procedure in place on how you will address those type of uh, situations. Um, you know, those who have lost loved ones uh, as a result of COVID-19, it would have been in very difficult circumstances. Perhaps they weren't there. More likely than not, they weren't there. So they will need ongoing flexibility and support. And as a business owner, you will need to be understanding, sympathetic and um, flexible uh, with your arrangements. 
sad reality, you may have a, an employee who has perhaps um, uh, died as a result of COVID-19 uh, and you may need to provide support to your colleagues um, and the rest of the team. You may need to be in contact with family members um, to um, provide them with support, particularly if you've got death in service as a benefit. A again, you know, these are things that you need to have a look at. So again, a planning tip, if you have got um, um, you know, death in service, or at least make sure you've got correct um, next of kin details. So again, you know who to contact, perhaps returning a box of, uh, of personal belongings, um, you know, back to, to the family. I'm sure they would uh, greatly appreciate that. Um, so again, uh, a planning tip, consider what additional support you may need to provide um, in, in relation to, to death and, and bereavement. Mental health is going to be another big area where you will need to uh, provide uh, additional support. Um, mental health, uh, you know, being in, in lockdown um, would have had a huge impact on uh, mental health. And coming back into work, uh, you know, line, manage line managers, uh, business owners will need to provide um, additional support, you would need to be handling it in a sensitive um, and supportive way uh, to the team. You might want to consider uh, whether you need to sign up to uh, an employee assistance program. Um, this is not something that will, um, well, it may be something that businesses have, um, but it might be something that you might want to think, well, maybe now's the time to actually provide that. Again, a top planning tip, um, if you want to have a look at introducing that into your workplace, Start doing your research now. Uh, we it can certainly uh, put you in contact with trusted partners that we work with uh, who will be able to help you with um, finding the right uh, employee assistance program. Managing holidays um, is another big thing. Um, if staff are allowed to carry holiday um, from their current um, uh, holiday year to the next uh, if they cannot take it as a result of um, you know the impact of COVID-19. You should still encourage staff to take their holiday because what you don't want is uh, to be storing up a liability of holiday pay for staff who are not taking um, their holiday. So encourage staff to still take um, pre-booked holiday, encourage staff to still take the holiday um, that um, you know, still a request to take that holiday. Have a clear policy uh, on how you are going to uh, deal with holiday requests. Uh, again, you might want to um, have a planning tip to perhaps put a holiday request policy and procedure in place because it might vary from your usual practices. You might again have um, employees who simply refuse point blank. They're not going to come back to work. Um, and, you, you know, this can be very frustrating, particularly when there is work to be done and you're having employees who are simply refusing to come back to, to work. Before you take any drastic action, um, you, you may want to consider alternatives. Um, so, for example, unpaid leave or holiday. Um, listen to their concerns. Again, try and give them some reassurance on the measures you have implemented to, uh, um, to ensure their safety in the workplace. Um, but if their, their refusal to come into work is just simply unreasonable, um, you may want to consider taking disciplinary action. But we would strongly advise don't just go straight to dismissal because that might be considered as an unfair dismissal. Again, I would strongly urge you to get professional um, advice on how to manage that type of situation. Again, you want to be mindful that you are not um, inadvertently um, opening yourselves to the risks of employment tribunals for getting it wrong. Training is another area where you want to perhaps give some further thought and consideration. Um, many uh, workers have been away from work from significant uh, time. You might want to consider refresher training. Uh, you might want to uh, incorporate that as part and parcel of a uh, reinstatement into work onboarding um, plan. So again, if this is something that you want to do, uh, a top planning tip is get that training planned in and identify what training you actually need your staff to carry out. Um, I've already touched on remote working. So again, um, th this might be something um, that you will continue in the future um, or it might be something that you decide not to continue with. 
Um, you might struggle uh, with withdraw withdrawing remote working, particularly if it has worked um, whilst you've been in lockdown. Uh, again, have that open and honest discussion with your employees to understand how um, uh, continued remote working can work. Digital invita invitation innovation has become quite um, the norm. I'm sitting talking to you today on, on a, a webinar. Um, I certainly have daily uh, uh, virtual team meetings with my team um, and very uh, uh, it works very well. Um, businesses may be considering actually doing this going forward. Um, it is um, a very uh, effective way of communicating um, and still keeping uh, those communications going. Again, I've touched on work-life balance. Uh, again, nearly all of those people who have been in lockdown and continued working have really learned to um, relish having the work-life balance. Um, so uh, again, it's really important to continue with that um, with your staff once they do come back into work. Looking at results-driven workforce, we've always had this um, assumption that um, you know presenteeism um, is 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 uh, the, the measure for results. Um, of course, you know we have now seen first-handed that actually you don't need to be present to be able to make a significant difference. Uh, I am sure that uh, many of you will understand that you have seen your A-team players um, during this crisis, um, and I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, different colours um, coming out of different workers um, and really you want to make sure that you want to have your A-team players and it may well be that you might have to have a very difficult conversation um, in, in terms of uh, continued employment with some employees. Um, so again, you know, you, you'll need to have a, a look at what your business is going to need. I'm very conscious of the time. Um, so the slides will continue, you know, contain a lot more information, but I really want to just get down to the nitty gritty on um, how to manage staff overheads um, so that you can bounce back um, quickly um, after lockdown. So we all we know that the government has introduced a number of measures to support businesses, um, and the coronavirus job retention scheme is only one of those. Um, we've already talked about what that scheme entails. Um, it is a grant to employers to pay uh, to cover 80% of wages up to a cap of two and a half thousand pounds per month. This is available until the 30th of June. Um, you can only claim for those workers who have been furloughed, and furloughed worker is someone who remains employed but isn't given, given any work uh, to, to carry on. The scheme is merely a mechanism for employers to be able to claim uh, money from HMRC. That's all it is. Um, I've already touched on um, that the scheme sits amongst your usual um, existing uh, employment law, statutory rights, protection from discrimination, protection from unfair dismissal and rights to consultation in, uh, in, in cases of collective redundancy. So let's have a look um, how you can use the furlough period um, to um, help with cost savings. So one easy, uh, quick uh, win is to ask staff to take holiday while they are on, on while they are on furlough. Um, the relationship between the furlough scheme and annual leave is quite complex. However, workers who are on furlough they can take holiday. They can still request to take holiday, um, and their annual leave will continue to accrue while they are on furlough. Um, so workers can, uh, as I say, take holiday. The difference is, is that they would get paid 100% of wages for any holiday days. So in order to manage your, your liability uh, as a business, um, you may want to consider requesting employees to take holiday while they are on furlough. So pre-booked holiday, keep that in and pay staff 100% of wages. You can still claim back the 80% through the scheme. So this is a really, really useful way of, uh, of um, limiting your liability um, at very little cost to the business, because as I say, you can claim the 80% uh, through the scheme. 
Of course, if you are requesting your staff to take holiday, uh, you will need to give them twice as much notice as you are requiring them to take. So for example, if you want them to take one week's leave, you will need to give them two weeks notice. And of course, for that one week, uh, they will receive 100% of pay. You will have to top it up with the 20% uh, so that they uh, receive 100%. And of course, you can claim the 80% um, through the scheme. This can provide significant savings for employers. So take advantage of the scheme while you can. Redundancy. Um, I talked about that process that you needed to, to start, the timelines that you need to be uh, mindful of. Making employees redundant while they're on furlough is permitted. So don't think you can't uh, uh, make staff redundant while you're on furlough. You absolutely can. But of course, you have to carry out that uh, legal process to make sure you don't fall foul of the law. So. Um, employees who are um, on furlough and have been made redundant, they will still be entitled to statutory redundancy pay. But let's have a look at how you can reduce your cost uh, and your exposure. So I've already talked about holiday. If you are making an employee redundant while they're on furlough, make sure that during that furlough leave, they are also taking their holiday and you're topping it up by that uh, 20%. Uh, of course, an employee who is being made redundant is entitled to notice um, and uh, you, you are required to either make them work that notice period. And I say work that notice period because if they are furloughed, they cannot undertake um, any uh, work which is going to provide a service or, or generate an income. They can remain on furlough and work out their notice period. So again, um, salary payments will need to be made. Um, but okay, despite um, the employee uh, being on furlough, they will be entitled to 100% of their notice pay. But again, this can be a significant cost savings to businesses if you are going to be making uh, using the furlough period for an employee to work out their notice period, and you will just need to top it up with the 20%. So if you're looking at a full redundancy process um, where you are normally having to pay out weeks, perhaps sometimes months of notice pay, um, you are having to pay them their, their, their um, uh, redundancy pay, you are having to pay them accrued but not yet taken holiday, and that sometimes can, can amount to quite a significant amount. And in recent uh, uh, days when I've been doing calculations for businesses that are going through that process, the savings can be thousands of pounds and it can actually reduce the outlay to businesses by over half uh, and in some cases more. So do, if you are going to have to go through the redundancy process, do make use of the furlough period to do so. You are perfectly within your right to do that. Um, I'm quite conscious that we've already gone past uh, the four o'clock. I have tried to cover everything that I can. Just very quickly, um, for, for um, those of you who are seeking uh, that support, that guidance, we do have a crisis package available to you. Please do go to our website. There will be a link in the communications that we send to you where you can uh, find out more about that crisis package. It is tailored to your specific business needs. It may just be, um, um, you know, short time working that you need support with. It may actually be a full blown restructure, redesign um, of, of your workforce, which requires redundancy. You might need to go through a detailed um, consultation. You might need to engage uh, and have employee reps uh, appointed to represent the workforce. So it might be quite complex. It's not a one size fits all. So do get in contact if you are going to need uh, that additional uh, support and, and help. As I say, it is tailored to your specific needs. So I'd love to have that one-to-one -one conversation with you to understand what you need to do with your business and how I can help you to get through that um, as um, easily as possible. Um, webinars, Friday afternoon webinars have um, become um, quite popular. Uh, they are going to continue. Um, but of course, next week we won't because next week is a change. Next week is actually the bank holiday um, it's a bank holiday. It's normally on Monday. So if any of you were going to turn up at work or not turn up at work on Monday, um, you might be having um, some business owners who, who might be quite frustrated why they don't have a workforce. Um, I think there's lots of confusion as to whether the bank holiday is on Friday or on Monday. Uh, it is on Friday. 
Um, I will certainly be having a long weekend, um, so there won't be a, a webinar next week, um, but do join us the week after that. Um, and of course, do send in your suggestions of topics that you will like, um, would like me to cover in, in more detail. HR for UK are here and ready to support you. Uh, do contact us. You can you can contact us by telephone. Um, our number is 01455 444 uh, You can drop us an email at info at hr4uk.com or you can visit our website at www.hr4uk.com. We're always here ready and willing to help you. So I thank you for your time. I've got quite a few questions um, from, from, from Lucy, uh, from Adam Scott. Thank you. Uh, Farouk, thank you very much. I'm just going to scroll this down. So please bear with me while I look into um, my laptop to see how I can move this down a little bit and these questions will be answered um, in more detail in the q a which will come out to you and um, we've got your um uh, direct uh, contact details so i will um email you directly um with these questions i'm having a little bit of a problem here with technology so do bear with me um while i try and move that i know questions have come in um, but I, oh, there we go. Um, so um, we resume business on Monday and furlough will end, but one of our employees does not want to come back for at least a few weeks after speaking with her mother as she has concerns that she herself, um, that it's too early. So I'm just trying to get to the rest of this question. So do bear with me. Um, you are he you're a heavily regulated healthcare business and have put in place uh, a number of additional uh, measures, um, including full PPE for staff uh, and clients if they want, hand sanitizers, increased cleaning, uh, no guest policies. Uh, she continues to say that her mother is anxious about her immune system, uh, is still weak, homeworking is not an option. What are your options um, with this particular employee? She's been with you for over two years. So again, the, the, the fact that she's been with you for over two years, um, you know, uh, she, she does have protected rights. Um, so you wouldn't be able to uh, dismiss her for whatever reason, uh, whatever actions you do take, you will need to go through due process. Um, I would certainly suggest that you have uh, a conversation with this particular individual, understand what, what is making her anxious um, especially after you've discussed with her about the measures that you have put in place. Um, is it her own immune system or is that an immune system um, of her mother's? So again, it's understanding uh, what her concerns are. If it is her own immune system, um, you have a couple of options available to you. Of course, we have the coronavirus job retention scheme, which is still available. Um, it is available until the 30th of June. Um, so you can leave the employee on furlough um, until the scheme comes to an end. Um, it is the employer's decision whether they want to do that. Um, but be mindful of what the other alternatives are. And the other alternatives are you could uh, request her to take it as holiday or perhaps you could um, request her to take it as unpaid. But I would strongly advise you to try and understand what the specific concerns are. If she has an underlying medical health condition, I would strongly recommend and suggest that you leave her on the furlough scheme. And that is why the furlough scheme was implemented in the first place. Um, so, uh, you know, business owners uh, and employers should take advantage of the scheme while it is still available. Um, I will take that question offline because I think there is a little bit more information and detail that we can pro provide with you. Um, and I will circulate a full detailed um, answer to that for those of you who are staying on the webinar and um, wanting to find out more information on that. Um, so I'll have a look at uh, just a couple of other questions. Uh, can you make redundancies um, while staff are on furlough and use furlough as notice period? Thanks, Adam. Yes, absolutely, you can. Um, you know, do make do make use of the furlough period. Uh, you can make redundancies. Uh, do make sure that you uh, comply with the um, uh, the the um, legal process that you need to follow. Um, put that plan in place, and again, make sure that you. Um, get uh, advice to make sure that you follow that process correctly. But as I said at my last uh, sort of 10, 15 minutes, you know, you can you can make redundancies, you can limit your financial exposure, 
by working out holiday and working out notice pay during furlough? So very good question. Thank you very much. Um, Lucy, um, you have asked a question. Um, is it 60 days in Northern Ireland? Um, I'll have to be honest and confess that I'll have to double check that for you, um, but I will respond to that um, once um, I've had an opportunity to just double check the uh, requirements for, for Northern Ireland because the rules are slightly different there. Um, and uh, what about a small cafe? My kitchen is very small and the areas would not be able to, um, to um, you wouldn't be able to social distancing, preparing tables, walkways, for, for, for example. So again, I think the government has got clear guidance on, um, you know, certain sectors and where social distancing is not um, uh, um, able to be conformed with. Um, Again, as I said in my webinar, I, I suggest that you have a look at what other measures you can put in place. And um, because again, if you've got people coming into your cafe, it's not only your employees that you have a duty and a responsibility to, you also have a duty and responsibility uh, to your, your um, visitors and your guests. So again, um, I, I will have a look at that um, offline. Uh, and again, I would strongly advise you to have a look at the government guidance um, in relation perhaps to restaurants, cafes, uh, and the like, and what uh, measures you can put in place specific to your business needs. Um, and I think that's probably about all that we have time for. There are a few more questions, um, but again, I'm quite conscious that uh, we're coming up for quarter past four. I've well exceeded my, um, my time. I would probably turn into a pumpkin. So I'd just like to take uh, this last opportunity of thanking you for your time um, and joining me this afternoon with this webinar. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Many thanks and have a good weekend. Bye-bye, everybody.